Hello everyone. Welcome back to the Art Power Hong Kong online talk series. Thank you for joining us today for the 11th installment of these talks. The discussion this week follows on from the Art Power HK online talk last week featuring Cosman Costinas from Parasite, P. Lee from M Plus, Rachel Burns and Polly Palmer Palmerini from the Museum of Half Truths, where they discuss the future of museum exhibitions. If you missed that talk, you can watch it in full on artpowerhk.com. Today's Art Power HK discussion will focus on the future of the performing arts. Over the course of the next 60 minutes or so, we will explore how the COVID-19 epidemic has impacted the performing arts from the way we interact and consume works to the manner in which new works are being produced. My name is Stephen Milliken, and I'll be serving as your moderator for today's discussion. I currently serve as the COO of Sinclair, but have previously held positions with performing arts institutions such as San Francisco Opera, Brooklyn Academy of Music, and the Fisher Center at Art College. On behalf of everyone at Art Power HK, I'd like to extend a special thanks to our esteemed panelists who represent three really important performing arts organizations here in Hong Kong. The first panelist I'd like to introduce is Allison Friedman, Artistic Director, Performing Arts, West Kowloon Cultural District. The West Kowloon Cultural District, located on the waterfront of Victoria Harbor, is one of the largest cultural projects in the world, integrating art, education, and public space. The vision of the West Kowloon Cultural District is to create a colorful cultural zone for Hong Kong and promote the interaction, cooperation, and development of the local art world. Next, I'd like to welcome Jennifer Chang, founder of BPM Dance Productions. BPM Dance Productions works closely with clients to transform brand messaging and themes into creative and entertaining performances. Their team of, world, of talented professionals come from all over the world, each with their own unique background and styles. And finally, I'm pleased to welcome Professor Jillian Chow, Deputy Director Academic for the Hong Kong Academy for Performing Arts. The Hong Kong Academy for Performing Arts was established in 1984 and is a leading tertiary institution for the performing arts in Asia. It provides a professional undergraduate education and practice-based postgraduate studies. The study encompasses Chinese opera, dance, drama, film and television, music, and theater and art, entertainment arts. Its educational philosophy reflects the cultural diversity of Hong Kong with emphasis on Chinese and Western traditions and interdisciplinary learning. That was a lot. <laughs> Welcome to each of you and thank you for participating in today's discussion. We're really pleased to have you all here with us today. Um, before we get started with the discussion itself, I thought it'd be um, a, a good opportunity for us to just kind of ground ourselves and share a little bit of background on the performing arts landscape here in Hong Kong. So according to recent uh, statistics, there are nearly 1,700 local organizations presenting or producing the performing arts in Hong Kong. Before COVID, these organizations staged over 5,200 performances annually. That's about 1,000 performances per week, which is a massive number. The last figures available show that performing arts contributed nearly 1.5 billion Hong Kong dollars per annum to the local economy. So as you can see, the performing arts in Hong Kong, as they are elsewhere in the world, really serve a purpose well beyond entertainment. They're also, you know, obviously a, a, an essential part of our culture, but our economy as well. And I think we're going to talk, touch on a lot of um, these topics. Uh, on, in today's discussion. Um, and this is why it's such an important uh, topic for us to be addressing. So with all of that, let's jump in. COVID-19 has been a global tragedy, without a doubt. Um, but it's also challenged the performing arts to innovate and adapt um, in exciting and unusual ways, really. My question to the panel is this. What do you see as some of the pitfalls that are attached to some of the positive outcomes that we are seeing. 
Allison, do you want to start with this one? <laughs> so we're going to look at the negative side of the positives uh, to start off. Yeah, Happy to. I think the conversation that I'm having with performing arts colleagues around the world is the business model issue. Uh, one thing, one of the positives that's come out of the COVID crisis is all of the online material that's uh, been going through Facebook, through live streams, and all of a sudden the consumption of performing arts both on stage as well as discussions has skyrocketed. And I, there was a recent article that was saying there's really been an, an actual documented researched uptick in people consuming performing arts and different kinds of culture and media during this period. So that's the positive side. The downside is now as places like Hong Kong, Taiwan, and those of us in Asia are starting to move back into um, live events and, and frankly, for everybody, how do we monetize this? In the crisis, there was great generosity to just get work out there, make it accessible and free, but that's not a long-term business model. So this is what the conversation is now. How do we keep the volume of, or, or, or keep the, the accessibility that online performing arts content um, helps deliver to much more diverse audiences, but make sure that it, also helps supplement and drive um, the live experience. Because ultimately, the thing about performing arts is the live experience, collective experience at a place in, in a moment in time. Right, right. Julian, what about from your perspective? You have to unmute, Jill. Oh, Julian, I think you're still muted. Uh, I think I'm okay now, right? There you are. Okay. Okay, so of course the positive side of, of, of it all, um, st uh, since we're dealing with education, is that we actually hopped into a, an online mode quite quickly. Originally, we started our semester, in, uh, we would have started our semester in February, but we couldn't. So then we spent a couple of weeks, worked very hard to bring as much as we could online in March and April. And with the, uh, with the view of opening up again uh, at some point. And, and in March, sort of mid-March, we actually made a decision, okay, let's not sort of have a meeting every two weeks to see whether we can open the next day. And uh, um, so we actually made a decision that June is going to be when we come back to campus. And we were actually quite correct. So we actually started again face-to-face uh, -face, uh, uh, last uh, last week and what we're really happy about is that uh, we also um, took the opportunity to encourage our, our teachers to actually think about what online can do to us when you know in the arts world in performing arts something that was uh, very skeptical before oh how can I teach uh, music online how can I possibly teach dance online but what we found uh, very differently is that everybody made the effort and it worked for everyone and what's also quite positive about the whole um, uh, experience is that students also were encouraged to um, uh, create online so we've had some uh, uh, zoom uh, uh, you know, collection of Zoom videos of students coming together, doing their own little uh, creative pieces, whether it's music or dance. And I think if you go to our website, uh, uh, our landing page, actually, we have some boxes which I, we can sh actually show you what they've been doing. So this kind of activity probably wouldn't have happened if we just continued, you know. <laughs> if, if COVID didn't happen, it would be the normal, you know, daily operation, okay? You know, classes are absolutely full daily. Uh, there's very little space to actually think, etc. But instead, instead, you know, um, people are trapped at home. So what do you do with yourself? And they actually were able to think very creatively about what they could do with their their life every day, um, um, trapped but not so trapped. Uh, in fact, fantastic. And Jennifer, what about from your perspective? Um, I think it's exactly what Gillian said. It's made us think kind of outside of our normal realm, outside of our box. You know, we're, we basically work in live events. So everything that we've been doing um, has gone for the last five months. Um, and it's made us rethink of, okay, what, you know, what 
are we going to do moving forward? Let's think outside of, of what we normally do. Um, we've started to do a lot of more uh, film content, online content, um, and trying to, it's difficult because I don't think, um, so like a lot of the dancers are doing classes online or they're doing performances online, but it's not quite the same experience yet. I don't think it's ever going to overtake kind of live events and people, you know, they love, they crave that sociability. They crave seeing the energy live, like it can't quite capture that yet. But I think it's definitely making us look into it and develop it more. Um, I think also we, 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 we've started looking at things like augmented reality, you know, incorporating that into the actual performance. So actually incorporating the tech more and, you know, making it more, um, yeah, exciting. And then another thing is because we started doing kind of smaller, smaller events are coming back now. So it's all about um, intimate. Everyone wants kind of more intimate events, connectivity, immersive events. You know, it's more focusing on that. Yeah. So it's, in a way, it's really made us, it's made us adapt and think and think of new ways. And I think that's a positive to the negative. Well, it's, it's interesting because I think this, this brings up um, another point of, you know, so many institutions have really talked about what, you know, if you look, you know, if we're looking to the silver lining of this, right, what an amazing audience development opportunity is for the institutions to reach those new audiences and to expand, you know, to expand their reach through their digital platforms. My question is, do you think that, are, we, are the institutions reaching new audiences through these platforms, or are they really just keeping their, their base engaged through a period when the stage is dark? Um, Jennifer, what do you think? Sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah, I was just wondering, as from an audience development perspective, mm -hmm. um, you know, if, if with all that's been put out on the digital platforms, right? We've had mm -hmm. everything from the Hong Kong Philharmonic um, mm -hmm. members, you know, performing in their living room, you know, mm -hmm. ballerinas doing, you know, showing their warm ups in their kitchen, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all of that. Um, you know, are these are these initiatives? Are they actually? developing new audiences for institutions, or are they um, more uh, intended to keep existing audiences and existing audience bases for institutions engaged? So kind of, are we already talking to our fan base? No, for sure, we're going, it's definitely more global. It's definitely opening up a whole new audience. Um, and I think, like you said, the content now is more intimate. People want to see not just, um, you know, when the lights go on in the stage and, and everything's on stage. They want to see behind, you know, the real people, the real performers. They want to see them in their room. It's gotten much more personal, I think. But definitely the reach um, is, is reaching past their normal audience and, and, and fan base. Um, so, and that's why they need, we need to change also what we're delivering because now it's a different kind of audience, yeah. Interesting. Allison? I would agree with that. We, um, West Kowloon was actually one of, if not the first arts institution in Hong Kong to go online in January and February, right, or February, right after the closures. On January 29th, the theaters were closed and on February 7th, we were broadcasting live on our Facebook our first performance at the Live House, which is the little cafe bar, live music live house in the lobby of Free Space at West Kowloon. And um, what we found was it absolutely reached people who had never been to West Kowloon. And we even had people message us and say, it's thanks to the live streaming that we knew you even existed. And they then came to the, the cafe to get a beer uh, the following weekend. So, um, anecdotal, but as well as actual evidence of people having seen the live things then driving traffic to the physical location. And I know certainly for colleagues um, globally, the criticism of all the online is that it was just a desperate attempt to kind of say, wait, we're still here. Uh, don't forget about us. And I think there is an element of that and the, the volume, people were just kind of desperately doing everything and there was quite a bit of quantity and not all quality. But I would say on balance, it, it, for most organizations and certainly for West Kowloon, it's allowed us to reach both new audiences and existing audiences in new ways. Um, as Jennifer said, you know, they get to see aspects of 
content that you wouldn't see in a theater just buying a ticket and sitting in the theater so also sorry can I just add one last thing? The, the ones that are, we are reaching, they're much younger. The ones watching Facebook Live, they're younger. They're not necessarily your traditional theater goers. They are, you know, they're up and coming and they're tech savvy. So it's definitely a new demographic. Will these new, you know, these new audience development efforts, this, you know, the, the, the live streaming, this, you know, such an emphasis on digital, do you think that that will be long-lasting beyond this? Will that be integrated into audience development strategies going forward? Or is this something that obviously it will fade over time as the focus shifts back on the stage? Jillian? Well, I, I, I think, uh, I think you, we're developing a different audience. I, I should hope that the online audience would stay. You know, uh, we would probably all think of ways of keeping some of these online elements because it's it's about you know putting out you know uh, creative activities you know uh, reaching further but at the same time it's also for promotion of our institution i mean some people have never seen anything we've done and suddenly now it's reaching you know much further than just hong kong or the region um at the same time as an or you know a member of audience myself i mean how how wonderful it is that now we could just go online and see all the bourgeois uh, ballets, et cetera, et cetera, which, which, didn't, which weren't free before. You know, we had to go to a cinema and sit there and, and, and watch it. And now it's, it's available for everyone. So does not mean that I don't go to the theater anymore? No, I would still go. I think I'm, I'm, I'm one of those who would still want to be sitting in the theater in the concert hall watching live. And I think that audience will always be there. But I think what, what we've done now is that we have reached further to the younger audience. Uh, maybe they would just uh, watch online, but maybe we would encourage some of them to actually come to live theater, live concerts as well. So I, I see this as something very positive. All right, Alison, how will this impact your audience development? Well, you know, if we are attracting a younger audience, Will there be, you know, special efforts to to continue and expand that, or you know, is it is it something that is that you're viewing as a as a more temporary, or that it will will shift over time? So digital strategy development and live streaming things like that were always part of our long term strategic development, and with COVID, it just fast tracked it to flip the priorities. We always thought, okay, maybe in a couple of years, let's get the buildings open first. That was our focus and priority, and the digital element was going to be a sort of slower uh, rollout. So the fact that COVID happened, it, it shifted our priorities and, and really boosted this up. Um, and it will continue. for Because we've already come this far, we're not going to then say, okay, and scene, stop. We, right. we, but we are going to pivot how we do it. Um, I think that Again, it's about driving people to the physical experience, the live experience, and then it becomes much more about content development. You're not putting out the performance, but maybe you're helping them understand more about Shichu and Chinese opera, or you're helping them understand how an adaptation into Cantonese of an original English play is done, or get to know these artists so you can become their super fans. And so to, to develop much more content around the performance to help drive different audience levels. Um, we also have somebody who in our in our division who's dedicated to accessibility and, and different needs and we're discussing is there a role that technology can play moving forward with accessibility, whether it's hearing impairment, whether it's um, people with different uh, cognitive abilities, what can we use the technology that's been fast tracked now to then help continue to expand our audiences and and um, and, and make uh, the regular sitting in a live theater more accessible to more people. And I, I, I think I, I'd like to add that it's not just about the audience, it's about the artists themselves. I think it's, it's really now performance as it has another mold, you know, at, it, it, it's something that performers also have to start thinking about, you know, okay, there's this thing called online performance. So how are we going to, how do we present ourselves? It's, it's something very, very different. We have to think about just like Alison was saying you know this was supposed to be you know the third priority you know it's 
nobody really wants to go online, etc. Now everybody is forced to go online, and and yeah. some of them actually see the beauty of it, and uh, and that it, it's suddenly fast track. Absolutely right. Yeah, and I was going to add. I'm glad you reminded me. In terms of the artist use, we because of the travel restrictions, we have a dance festival coming up this September. Mm -hmm. And one of the companies from Japan was going to come with a, a couple different productions. Now we're working with them to come up with a project that's an ins a light installation in the box at Free Space, and then the performer solo. If the travel restrictions still exist, he's going to do his solo in Japan and we'll screen it into the room. If suddenly the travel restrictions are lifted, or not the restrictions, the quarantine, then he can get on a plane and do the solo live. So the exact performance doesn't change, just whether or not the dancer is doing his solo in Japan or in the room at, uh, in Hong Kong is what's going to shift. And we're not going to know till probably, right now it looks like three or four days before the show. And all of this is possible because of digital. No pressure. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. That actually, that kind of leads into another question that, that I had. Um, you know, how do you see the pandemic impacting the future of performing arts from the artistic perspective? Um, I mean, we'll get into the business side of things and all that in a little bit, obviously, because, you know, you can't avoid it. But, um, you know, for example, you know, as you mentioned, you know, will works be more intimate in the foreseeable future? Or is there going to be this, this rush to create bigger works that, that bring in more people because we've been isolated for so long? Or... You know, is, is, it going to, is there going to be a fundamental shift to, to works that were created specifically for online presentation? Um, and, you know, and then there's also that, that interesting um, scenario where, you know, are, are artists going to find themselves torn between the medium that they have been working in for so long and suddenly having to create works that are, um, that translate well to a digital platform. Allison, do you want to lead this one? Uh, I was thinking the artist could lead this one. <laughs> Jennifer, Jennifer, lead. Um, I think it, I don't think we're going to jump straight away. It's not going to be now. Everything's going online. You know, forget live performances. That's it. It's, I don't think it's going to be like that at all. I think we're definitely going to go back slowly. It's not going to be big concerts um, back tomorrow. Like I said, like we're getting small events gradually, but they're still staying quite small. Um, but I do think it's an eye opener. So artists are going to start thinking of how to do it because it still needs development. It's very, it's very different just performing to a camera. It's not, it's not the same, you know, it's not the same experience at all. So we need a while to develop this. Um, in terms of the content, I think it will be more intimate. I think it is more real. It's not so showy. Um, that's personally, that's what I think. That's what I feel. Everyone around me seems to be making very personal, connected stuff during this time. Um, yeah, but I don't think it's going to be a massive change straight away. It's something, it's, it's a pivot, right? It's a pivot in our whole kind of global outlook. So everything takes a while to, to move with it. But I think our perspective has changed, definitely. And Jennifer, we, we had a question from an, from an audience member, actually, mm -hmm. um, you know, asking, could there be a surge of online collaboration or experiments post-pandemic, post and could this uh, be one way forward? Are you starting to see more online collaboration? Yeah, I mean, there's loads, there's lots. Um, like kind of, I think they call it cloud filming. So one, one dancer records, you know, the first two eights and the next dancer in another country, and then it's all edited together. Or like the Lady Gaga, um, uh, all the you know all the musicians were, were recording on their own. I think there's a lot of that. Um, I'm not sure. I think we will incorporate that, but I'm not sure it's going to be exactly like that. Because once people are allowed out, they want to go back. In they want to go back to training in a big group. They want to go back to their company. They want to you know actually be part of a show again. So I'm I'm. I'm curious to see what it's going to be like. Um, I think we'll definitely keep some of it, um, like an amalgamation. Oops, sorry, amalgamation of the both. Yeah. And Julian, I know you you said that the students had had created some works. Um, do you think you see this online collaboration as a path forward for the students, 
or you know, are they aching to be in the room together and have that physical collaboration? Well, I think I think uh, what we've seen now. I mean, they they were uh, quite inventive in the way they used on the, the, the online platform uh, in the past few weeks, a couple of months actually. Mm -hmm. um, and we, uh, you know, one of the uh, examples is we had a, a complete cello cello ensemble, and the students had put it together themselves. It wasn't anybody encouraging them. They 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 did it themselves. And some of them were in, you know, in mainland China. In fact, one of the students uh, is from Wuhan, trapped there, couldn't get back. Um, so, so they basically organized the whole thing, and it was collaboration. It wasn't an, you know, ensemble uh, playing one tune. You know, it was actually an ensemble with parts. Um, so, so that sort of thing. And it wasn't that difficult to do. The sound system, of course, you know, they're doing it from home. It's not fantastic but the playing was great the effort was wonderful and it gives the idea to other students too that it's uh, it's doable and dance students have done the same thing um, so uh, you go back to earlier when you're saying you know uh, you know with live performances treat um, I don't think they will I mean frankly uh, we just got back to campus last week and everybody's desperate to get back Mm -hmm. to see real people you know mm -hmm. <laughs> so so even in a meeting suddenly gosh we have a room of people you know we are not trying to listen to you know this person speak and we can't see their faces because there are 20 people trying to you know uh, fit into a screen or something so it, i think for the audience it's the same thing i think uh, uh, i wouldn't be surprised that uh, um, people are so desperate to go back that maybe all the venues should think of, of really, um, you know, increasing the, 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 the performances, definitely, and not, 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 not uh, um, thinking of cutting, cutting performances because there won't be anybody coming because everybody is so desperate to just go online and don't have to pay for tickets. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm very uh, optimistic that uh, a theater, theater, concerts, all the physical activities will return as normal or even more so. Um, and uh, the online will, will, will continue because there is still that audience. Yeah. Which leads in very nicely to another question that I had for you. You guys are doing my job for me. This is amazing. Amazing. Um, as we look ahead, West Kowloon is um, opening for performances at the end of June, correct? Um, yep. Hong Kong Academy for Performing Arts, you're looking at uh, resuming performances in July, I believe. And then um, BPM, you've been back in the studio for a while now. And yeah. Fun event next week. Woo -woo. Woo. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so and I guess the, you know, my question is, at a time when so many members of the public are still a bit wary of large groups and gathering together, right? Um, the, what do you think the return to the theater, the physical theater, will look like? You know, we've seen reports that, you know, some theaters are removing rows in between to give that social distance in front and behind. Other theaters are looking at rings of eight empty seats around all, each audience member. Um, you know, how, what's your vision for that, that audience experience once we are able to, to go back? At West Kowloon, even while the theaters were closed, we have this big, beautiful art park that's right on Victoria Harbor, and it has been packed from start to finish. I think during the four-day weekend earlier in the spring, on that Sunday, we had 9,000 people in the park over that Sunday after, um, daytime. So yeah, people are wary of crowds and also not so much. And certainly in large open spaces there's this perception that it's safer and so we are starting we're focusing already this weekend having performances in the art park outdoors so if you come by this saturday and sunday afternoon we have different music ensembles performing just outside free space uh, we have some pop-up shows coming up in the coming weekends so with live performance out in the open space and then of course our big jazz festival this november which is indoor and outdoor um, there are, for indoor, we're also ramping up slowly to hopefully restore customer confidence. And we'll start doing some open houses at the big theater, the box at Free Space, where 
you can, um, we'll do more installation screening kind of experiences, more like a gallery than a theater where people can come in and out. We can manage numbers a bit better. When we do restart performances, both at our Tea House Theater and Shichu Center, and also at Free Space later this month, there are regulations we have to follow. So if you're under a PPE license, you have to be at 50% capacity and no more than eight people in a row. So we've been playing Tetris Sudoku puzzles with mm -hmm. figuring out different seating arrangements for our different venues. We've got the box at Free Space, we have the room, we have the studio, we've also got the Grand Theater at Shichu Center, the Seminar Hall, the Tea House Theater, and all the studios. So working out different options, both for our own programs, but also for people who want to hire us, if, if we you know, cap that capacity or they think they're not gonna be able to sell, it's not a viable business option for them. So ramping up slowly, but it will be a trial and error as we go, because nothing is, I mean, nobody's experienced this before. So we're hoping to get to higher capacity. Taiwan just announced a couple of days ago, they're opening their theaters at full capacity already. So goals. <laughs> Touch wood, touch wood. Jillian, what about you? Because I know the, the Academy for Performing Arts, you have, you, you have to um, operate at a higher level of government standards, right? Um, so how is that going to impact uh, your return to the theater space? I think uh, it, it'd be great that Allison, you know, uh, have the, the, the space outside, et cetera, and can also test the performances uh, and the audience. Uh, for us, and um, uh, you know, because we are a campus, and uh, at the moment we are uh, we have restricted, well, limited entry. So only our students can come in, and even then we have to be very careful how many of them are in a room, etc. So apart from the thousands of sanitizers, we have to uh, <laughs> spread them around, and then also spreading uh, classes uh, apart so to allow cleaners to go in for 15 minutes if there's a smaller room half an hour is a bigger room. So the, the operational side is just, you know, tremendous. I mean, it's just enormous uh, amount of work that, uh, and effort that everybody has to go into in order to, to open the campus. But we, 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 uh, we, we don't allow the public in at the moment, but we have plans to, um, to, to, to open our productions uh, later on in July. So, so the only thing is crossing our fingers that we can actually uh, do it at full capacity. But um, if not, then exactly what, <laughs> what Alison is saying, we will follow the regulations of the government and most likely we will be following the LCSD uh, regulations at the time and we'll do what we can. And we have hire us. Uh, we uh, normally hire the Lyric uh, Theater out, which is, uh, of a thousand one hundred eighty seat, you know, capacity. So um, for that theatre, for instance, the hirers are coming in, and we would have to actually inform the hirers that they too have to uh, follow um, a government regulations. So it could be, you know, eight in a row, or or something like that. But uh, we we'll, we'll see when we get to it. Yeah, and Jennifer, I know your company works in less traditional performance spaces, shall we say. So how are you advising, how are you crafting the works, you know, looking forward to when you, when you are performing, you know, how, how, how are you advising your, your, um, your clients on these presentations and setting this up? Um, I really, like if it's a client event, I don't really have control over how the setup is all done by them, usually. I mean, they all, they all kind of had their guidance and that usually follows the venue too, so it kind of filters down. Um, the events so far have been outside, so that's, that's key. Um, and there was talks of doing it with the dancers with masks on, but I think that's um, not going to happen. Um, but other than that, I think it's, um, it, it's down to, so they are obviously limiting their numbers that are coming in, but because it's from the client, then it, that will all come from them, really. Our rehearsals, we, we do in our own private studio, and then we, ha we have control over that. Mm -hmm. And that's the standard sanitized mask. Right. You know, and then, we, you know, we're close to each other already, so we know, yeah. Great, great. Um, shifting gears a little bit, um, and as we think about the current situation, one of the things that I, I find really 
incredible is that sense of solidarity that, that emerges in a time of crisis like this, right? And I find it very powerful, the way that communities come together. Um, how, has the, how has the Hong Kong performing arts community come together to support the field as a whole? Um, for example, um, Jennifer, I know BPM has launched Perspective, which is designed mm. initiative to, to, to inspire artists and audiences through film, right? And West Kowloon um, has launched the Arts Relief Scheme to provide critical funding to organizations. Um, can you tell us a little bit about these efforts um, and the others that you've seen to really, you know, where the community is coming together to support one another? Jennifer, do you want to start us there? Um, yeah, so we started Perspective. Um, we didn't actually start it as a project. We started it because we wanted to keep creating in a time when we're not really doing anything um and it's become a it's a series a, a a short dance film series um with over kind of 30 different directors and choreographers and composers dancers um, editors all coming together working mm -hmm. on the film um and it just grew so we just wanted to bring people in and kind of you know keep the energy going, the positivity, and just keep the momentum going at a time when everyone was out of work and kind of in dire straits. Um, and that's been really, really nice. It's been, it's a time of true kind of creativity for us because we can, we can do, a, uh, you know, create art without a client or without kind of boundaries. Um, and it's been really nice. We've met loads of different people from all different ends of the industry from documentary filmmakers to um, break dancers, um, you know, just so many different types of industry coming together. And I think everyone's got that same mentality now. You know, it's, it's a time of collaboration and coming together to support each other. Oh, yeah. well. Alison, what about the, what about the yeah. art team? It's been, well, our support has happened in phases. <coughs> it, when things, when the theaters first shut at the end of January, beginning of February, we our primary focus was how can we pay artists how can we find ways to keep them engaged to not just say oh sorry it's canceled force majeure by um that's just irresponsible so we did as much as we could i mean because we had no income either we're not funded by the government for operations or programming so it was a balance but we also knew that as a big fish in in this pond we have to be responsible so our first priority when it started february was to pay whatever we could whenever we could and then because the live house could operate at that time we continued to program we did almost 50 shows in six weeks until march when the next wave was more strict and then any kind of performances couldn't happen and we had to cancel so until that happened in that earlier phase we just kept trying to find ways to engage artists for different projects um, and then the arts relief scheme that you mentioned is uh, generous uh, gifts from our senior executives plus our board chair into the foundation that West Kowloon has to create a scheme uh, for artists to create projects digitally and it's, they have about a year to complete them. And actually yesterday was the deadline for submission and we were blown away. Nearly 400 applications have come in uh, and the turnaround is going to have to be fast because it has to be responsive. So we want to be able to get this out as soon as we can um, so that artists can start working on these on these incredible ideas incredible and Jillian what are you how are you seeing the arts community come together to support one another well I think we've already seen a lot of that um, there, there are so many um, webinars you know uh, with artists coming together um, you know whether it's drama or music or dance and people are really sharing everything they're doing um, uh, whether it's you know the worries about how they're doing it. and we we're, for instance in Hong Kong we are slightly ahead of maybe UK America etc so we can actually tell them our experience you know how we actually cope with the whole uh, you know the whole uh, COVID affair and um, and of course you know for our alumni who are out there you know they they of course here to close the venues are closed they are actually in you know um, some of them really basically they have no income particularly the freelancers so we're trying I think uh, many artists in Hong Kong professionals are really looking into how we can actually help all the young all those particularly the younger artists survive and what would we do for them when everything opens up etc and even for us because we can't actually open our campus right now but we are thinking about when we do, 
um, what can we do for our alumni who are performing mm -hmm. artists, uh, particularly the younger alumni, you know, those with uh, medium to small scale companies, for instance, um, uh, can we actually do better with the rental, et cetera, um, just to help uh, start up? And so this, this is the sort of thing that I, I think whenever I talk mm -hmm. to anyone, you know, in the, in the, in the community, the theater community, everybody is really thinking very hard and coming together to, to think of ways to actually help uh, to, to revive you know, the performance, uh, performing arts in, in Hong Kong, particularly um, for, the, for the young artists. Right. And it's interesting, um, both uh, Julian, you and Alison have mentioned, you know, kind of the, the, the financial side of things. So let's, <laughs> let's spend a minute looking at that. Um, the, um, you know, and I'm particularly interested in the, the revenue streams for, for the performing arts. Um, and I think, you know, obviously our, our experience will be here in Hong Kong, um, but globally we've seen a lot of different things happening, right? We've seen um, uh, corporate sponsorships um, in certain markets double down wh whenever possible. Um, we've seen calls for tax reform in the UK to help the artists there. Um, so, you know, here in Hong Kong, I think, you know, with the, with the panel we have here today, you know, we have an, a mix of governmental, nonprofit, for-profit um, funding models, really. Um, so I'm curious, from your perspective, and obviously this may be within the you know, Hong Kong uh, biosphere, um, how has COVID impacted arts funding? Um, and what needs to change going forward? I mean, this has really been an eye-opening moment for us when it shows us all of the, um, the weaknesses the funding systems that we have right now, whether they're private or governmental. So what changes need to happen to, to kind of build that safety net for the performing arts going forward? Should something, heaven forbid, like this ever happen again? Uh, Allison, do you want to start that one? The million dollar question. <laughs> yes, <I know>. Sorry. <laughs> it will never happen again. I know, I know. Inshallah. Yeah. Um, what, what COVID has revealed to the world is that the performing arts funding models are deeply problematic. Um, Hong Kong's is in a better place because of the high reliance on government subsidy through the Leisure and Cultural Services and Home Affairs Bureau. So they um, already fund so much in Hong Kong um, the corporate sponsorship in Hong Kong for performing arts, you know, there's some bright spots, obviously, like Swire for Hong Kong Philharmonic and, and other corporations. Um, we were very fortunate to have Standard Chartered support our Tea House Theater when we first opened for the first three month season in 2020 uh, last year. I, but they're hurting. So the whole interconnected ecosystem is struggling right now. And the other aspect of performing arts is you need healthy diversity of artists, but so much of what diversity means is independent artists which work on a gig economy. And if there are no gigs, there's no economy, no income. So um, the number of people I know back in the US who are now on, on uh, unemployment, um, you know, there's one institution that's one to me, one of kind of the leading models of performing arts institutions in Canada. And within the first week of closures, they laid off 75% of their staff, which is almost 400 people. So uh, it doesn't matter what size or scale, nobody was um, immune to the financial impact of COVID. And the recovery is gonna be long and hard and needs government support. It's not gonna work otherwise, and corporate support. I mean, the, the sponsorship needs to come back, the philanthropic element. Um, and, and I have to say, if COVID hasn't demonstrated the value of the arts, I don't know what will, given how many people logged on and spent their quarantine and spent their isolation watching films, what, reading books, watching performances online, learning a new, a new you know, banjo riff from a teacher online. So the volume, the appreciation, I, I would hope has been kind of demonstrated throughout this, that people need to start putting their money where that quarantine mouth was to, to help revive it. Mm -hmm. Julian? 
yeah, I would agree with that because um, I think, you, you know, people sort of enjoy performances without really thinking what's behind it. And the, uh, you know, uh, during this period, all the freelancers, um, they are suffering because Absolutely. once there's a canceled performance, there's absolutely zero income. So I think those who appreciate the arts who are, are able to um, help out, you know, I, I just hope that they would come forward and start thinking about those people, you know, those wonderful performances that they have enjoyed and uh, what actually goes behind the scenes that they would come together and uh, and come up with the funding to help those in need. Yeah. And Jennifer, how is your company, because it's a slightly different model, how is, how is your organization safeguarding itself and you know how are you seeing the artists do the same? I mean I don't think we did safeguard ourselves. No. <laughs> we, didn't, we, we didn't know it was coming. Um, we were lucky that we had a really, because our peak season is up until December, January, we had a good season, but we've just been running on empty and just trying to, to you know, wait for it to, to come back. I mean, the situation for Hong Kong, for freelance, any artist, um, I work with all freelance dancers, musicians, so, you know, everyone's freelance. I feel like they're almost like a missing group in Hong Kong. There's no support. There's been no, um, they literally have no income. They have no you know, there's an MPF scheme, but none of them pay MPF. There's all this other kind of support that they can get if they you know, have whatever, but they don't fit into any of that criteria. So everyone I know is just on zero income for the last five months. It's really quite dire. Um, and to get back, you know, and that does not help creativity at all. Um, so I don't know. Luckily in Hong Kong, you know, a lot, a lot of the locals might have family that they can stay with, um, but there are a lot of non-local freelancers here too. And, um, you know, it's a very, really, really tough situation. Um, what was I gonna say? Oh, so that I've been thinking about it recently, you know, I was thinking, and they don't have insurance. So, you know, in, in the UK, you might get insurance for something like this. You don't have that in Hong Kong. Or you would have a union, you would have equity, or you know some kind of other support. There's none of that in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. So then I was thinking, is that something that we should, you know, look to start to to safeguard for, you know, in the chance that it does happen again, or something like this happens again? Um, because it's yeah, it's not an easy situation. Yeah. No. Interesting. And I think you know, one of the things it's been a good a point that Allison made earlier, um, you know, when we talk about um, individuals, you know, the kind of the, the, the revenue, you know, bringing the back in and, and you know, the impact that that will have on the revenue stream. Do you think um, that the new audience members that have been, that we've attracted um, through all of the, you know, the digital performances, that they will actually convert into ticket buyers when this is all over? Or are they just inhabitants of a digital world? Um, Jillian? Well, I think uh, we, we, we touched on that a, a little bit earlier. And I, I don't believe that people will, will just stay online and forget about yeah. the theater. So, so I, I, I firmly believe that there is an online type of audience and there's mm -hmm physical type of audience. I think those who are used to going to the theater and concert, concerts, you know, um, I would continue to do it and yes, we can come back to that. But what we've got, the, the you know, uh, during this period, because so much has been online, is I think we've developed um, a huge uh, audience, uh, online audience, uh, who some of them may not know that much about performing arts at all who may be now interested so maybe they'll just stay online but uh, maybe they'll be encouraged to um come to our theaters yeah allison do you see a point in time where we might have to monetize some of these digital broadcasts absolutely as soon as possible <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. i mean i it, it the 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 kind of um scattershot spray of online content 
I think was a very, in, in some ways panicked, in some ways very smart reaction to what happened. Um, but now that we know this is not a short game, uh, we can create, you know, take the time to create more highly produced things. And we've already started that. We'll be launching some Shichu Chinese opera education videos later this fall that we've been working on while the studios are closed to the public. We've been using different spaces to be able to record. And initially some of those will be free. And then, and then as we build it up to have more online courses, I mean, there's, that's not a new thing. Uh, Berlin Philharmonic was charging, NT Live was charging before this. So to go back to that, we'll take an adjustment, but it shouldn't, I mean, people, it's a value proposition. You have to just pay for things that they're worth it. Mm -hmm. And I think performing artists can continue to, to perform free. <laughs> so yeah. it's only fair that even if it's online, that there's a charge. Um, yeah. I think they've had a, a, a really good taste of it now, you know, free for two months and it's time, yeah. that, you know, um, all the the companies start thinking about it. I think those online performances is very good for the artists themselves because they they they, they kept themselves exactly. going. There's a sense of purpose uh, while they're kind of trapped. Right. But I think it's a different kind of content. You can't. Uh, it doesn't like filming a Broadway musical and then just putting the, the exact same thing online doesn't translate. It yeah. needs to almost, you know, it needs to be short and snappy and, and almost a different format from, from the live. Completely but, agree. Yeah, it's not an instead of, it's absolutely yeah. its own it needs to be genre, a its own, yeah. 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 It has to but be produced. The, the tutorials have worked really well. The ones, mm -hmm. you know, that you download and you pay for, that has worked really well because I think they've also developed the format for that, mm -hmm. just not the live yet. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and for performers, certainly, you know, if someone is sitting watching you from a distance, you know, the way you perform is very different mm -hmm. from, from when uh, the camera is right on you. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think this is something that, uh, you know, we've seen like the Met Opera, uh, you know, videos and even the ballets that we've seen. Uh, National Theatre have had all these uh, cinema versions. Um, and, and, and they actually do special uh, sessions for that purpose. They don't just video a, a normal a live performance because it doesn't work. The lighting yeah. will work. Um, yeah. Performers have to uh, behave differently. So it's a, it's a totally new model. Okay, I have one last question um, mm -hmm. for each of you before we turn to the audience questions. Uh, and that is, what is the number one performance that you are most excited to see when the theaters reopen again? Oh, oh. oh. so many. <laughs> I don't know what's gonna be out there. I think it would be very excited to see one of our own because we've been waiting for so long and I wow. hope it's going to work in July when we open again. It will. It will. I'm excited for our Tea House Theater. Our first Tea House Theater performance <laughs> for the media will be the end of this month and then the public tickets go on sale very soon for July 9th. So July 9th, you can see our, our rising stars at the Shichu Tea House Theater. I can't wait. Fantastic. Fantastic. I want to see those two as well. <laughs> but I, I would quite, I miss um, live concerts. I want to mm. see like, yeah, live yeah. music concert. That's what I really, I miss. Yeah. That kind of a dance in a big loud room. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just having the freedom to mm. rub people and have that loud music in the background. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, that's all the questions that I have. So I'd like to open this up to our audience. And um, for those of you viewing from afar, um, feel free to enter any questions that you have at the bottom of your screen under the Q&A section. And we will answer them. Do we have any questions from the public? We have covered everything <laughs> the performing arts. Um, okay, so I have one. Let's see. Uh, prior to COVID, one of the successes of digital uh, of digital content creators 
was reflected through the conversion of their digital content into leads to live events, merchandising, and other financial revenues. Have industries considered their digital strategies and business models, and how can this be applied to institutions and not just individuals? How important is the role of digital content creator for the performing arts? Uh, Allison? It's the, well, the last question, uh, the role of digital content creator for performing arts institutions like West Kowloon that is a venue and a location, I think it's a, extremely important. As we've said, digital content is its own thing. It's not just a copy paste or a Xerox of the live event just put online. It has to have its own curation, its own production value, and it's very specific. Um, and what kinds of things you put online, you know, education and talks, talks can be very boring. Ours isn't, but you know. <laughs> so um, to have people who are really rapidly developing that expertise, it is a new, I think it's in terms of future job prospects, it's a very high one. It's already out there in other areas. The, their question about how it links to the overall um, system or structure of products, branding, merchandising, and other revenue streams that way makes a lot of sense. I mean, the Broadway model is with their merchandising and Disney, that, that works very well. So I'm not sure if that's exactly what they meant. It's certainly something we've talked about for Shichu Center, which has a gift shop, Free Space, which will have an online gift shop, if there are ways to integrate video content that just develop the brand and, and help drive merchandise. The thing with performing arts centers, unlike museums, is the, that merchandising element has always been a nice to have, but not a must have. I think there's an opportunity to develop that and change it. Um, I think the era of like DVD merchandising is gone. People aren't necessarily buying that. They might pay for an experience online or to see something that you couldn't see elsewhere. But um, I think it's, it's, well, it's um, new territory. Sure. Yeah, Jennifer, Jillian, did you have any additional thoughts? I think I think uh, for for us because we are a school, it's it's quite different. We are not going to be churning these things out daily, but uh, but but since you know already people are getting more interested in online material, even you know within the school, I I would see that uh, the role of digital content creation for performing arts will 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 absolutely be there and our students will certainly uh, make use of this platform to do different things. Uh, they will be performing on stage, but they will still probably continue to do some of these collaborations online. Um, and it's, it's of course, it's, it's great for promotion too, you know, of the institution if we continue that. Um, if you uh, look on, uh, on our, you know, the landing page of our website, you actually see uh, the different videos created during this period, uh, the, the type of work our students are doing, you know, just snapshots of some of them. And they're, they're, they're actually very interesting work and it's, it's, it's totally original. Um, and I think this will continue and it will be important. And Jennifer, I know obviously you, 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 you kind of marry dance and film and you know, multimedia, all of that. Um, so mm -hmm. the, the role of content creator, how do you see that evolving from your perspective? Digital, you mean? Digital content? Yes. Um, so I was thinking before this, I created a theatre show before COVID. Um, and since then, it I have decided that we are going to do it both ways. So it's going to be digital and live theatre. But in doing that, I've had to change the whole format. I have to rethink exactly how um, everything from, from, you know, the length to the... Um, storyline to you know everything about it kind of changes um so i do think it's it is really important um and i think that's going to be aspect of everything we do now moving forward Great. how not sure yet but yeah <laughs> <laughs> gonna get there um we have another question do you plan on continuing to stream online even after covid and will this continue i think we've we addressed that. i think everybody's in agreement that this is something that will be part of the new normal as we go forward, yes? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, another question we have, we previously uh, mentioned how as a result of COVID and streaming performances online, your audiences have changed as well. You know, we now have a younger audience, uh, age, uh, younger age group taking interest. Do you think this will continue and how do you plan on keeping them interested? Will, I guess from a programmatic standpoint, you know, will programming be 
um, uh, approached differently to maintain younger audiences? Or is the goal more educating or familiarizing, I should say, the younger audiences to the work that you're already presenting? What will be the approach there? Jennifer, how are you? I think it depends on your existing project. Like the theater show I mentioned is already targeted towards a young audience. So that is definitely something that has to be incorporated. But if I was doing something maybe more classic, then it's not as, um, as important, I think. Or not, not as important, but it won't be as involved. Um, I, I wouldn't target then this younger digital audience for something that they probably wouldn't go and see anyway. Right, right. Allison? One interesting example of digital integration is actually a project that's coming to Free Space later this month. On and on Theater Workshop here in Hong Kong has a, pro a theater production where part one is a series of podcasts. So you have to listen to the podcast on Spotify or another platform. And then part two is in the theater this June 26th through the 29th. And, um, and so I think already artists are integrating different digital platforms and formats for it. And, and, um, and that will just continue. And, and again, as Jennifer said, the different projects will dictate the form. Great. And Jillian, I'm gonna give you the last word on this one. <laughs> um, well, I mean, we are an education institution. Of course, we are not, we are not here to just attract a certain age group. We, we want to attract <laughs> all age groups. Um, um, but at the same time, you know, we try everything because we, we research, we want to make sure our students actually uh, have the experience. Um, and so, you know, basically we, we've tried things in the past, you know, with AR, VR, we are really actively developing um, sort of the media side of, of performing arts as well in performance and film, etc. Um, so, so everything goes really. Uh, so, uh, when it comes to digital content, it's very important for development of uh, the future of the theater as well. You know, people do expect to see a little bit more than just people playing on stage or dancing on stage. And uh, the shows that we've produced in the last few years certainly have a lot of that content already, COVID or not. Um, so, um, yes, we, we will we'll, we'll continue to, to be interested. In, in, in increasing uh, the digital content in some areas. We have six schools, six very different disciplines, and um, they all have plans to actually expand in the digital area. Um, so uh, we do look forward to some very interesting performances uh, coming from, um, from our students. Great, great. Well, unfortunately, that is all the time that we have for our discussion today. Um, I'd like to thank all of the viewers and especially a special thank you to our, our panelists today. Thank you so much, everybody, for, for taking the time out of your day to join us. Um, one last note, I would like to um, invite everyone to join us for Art Power HK's next discussion, which due to the public holiday on the 25th of June will be held on Wednesday, the 24th of June. Mark your calendars. Um, details will be at artpowerhk.com very soon. Um, thank you again, everybody, for joining. For all of the, the, the uh, viewers out there, um, thank you for joining us, and I encourage everybody to buy tickets. Um, <laughs> support here, your here. Mm -hmm. um, So thank you, and have a wonderful evening. <laughs>